tonight's lecture. Tonight we have uh, Stephen Wright, uh, who's visiting from Paris. He's here uh, to give this lecture, but also to conduct the workshop, which he began yesterday with the students of uh, the Studio Art and Art Artistry Program at UB, and the workshop continues tomorrow. Uh, how to introduce Stefan? Uh, I should say he's a friend, and I should sit down, but uh, it's not enough, I suppose. But he is a friend, he's a friend of the city. Stefan, uh, Stefan's relations to Beirut began uh, around 2002, when he was uh, co-editor of the now defunct Harvard, now defunct uh, a Canadian art uh, magazine, uh, Parachute. And he, he came to Beirut to, uh, to research for a special issue for that uh, magazine, an issue that since has become referential, uh, mostly for the uh, very well thought out introductory text that he wrote. Um, and since then, he's, been, he's remained a friend of many people in Beirut, uh, collaborating with many, uh, giving workshops. Uh, but let me give you some factual information about Stefan. Uh, so he's a Paris-based artist, uh, art writer, and, and, and uh, a teacher of the practice of theory. And this is something he insists upon, the practice of theory. At the European School of Visual Arts, uh, he recently published a, a wonderful uh, lexicon uh, on usership, uh, which I have as a PDF, and if you don't mind, I can really disseminate it. Oh, please, that's what it's for, yeah. The, the broader the usership, the better. <laughs> so he's interested in the notion of uh, usership as opposed to spectatorship, as opposed to ownership. I'm sure you'll talk about these uh, concepts tonight. Um, and I remember a few years ago, he, I invited him to the, uh, to the Department of Architecture and Design and he gave a lecture on extra disciplinarity. And I remember the students, uh, I had a few students who would do the poster and who usually do very well in designing posters for all the other lectures, but for Stefan's lecture, they, they, they just draw a blank. What does extra disciplinarity mean? We, we, we hear a lot about inter and cross disciplinarity, but what is extra disciplinarity? They drew, they drew a blank and this, that a poster said, Exodisciplinarity, come to the lecture. <laughs> uh, so this is a concept that this is a concept that he works with a lot, extradisciplinary uh, practices. And something else he calls uh, an art with low coefficient of visibility. Uh, an art doesn't appear, or at least that you have to access through other means and other senses. Uh, he's also a curator, uh, a very demure curator. Uh, but he's made some really interesting uh, projects, uh, such as the future of the reciprocal ready-made. I would love a catalog of that one if you have. Uh, in uh, 2004, later, a year later, he created another exhibition titled In Absentia. If you can begin to see where he's working. Later on, in 2006, uh, Rumor as Media. And uh, that same year, Data Aesthetics. The team, Data Aesthetics. And he is currently preparing, among other projects, uh, something he calls Withdrawal, the performative document. Um, and one can say that most of these practices that Stefan is engaged in, engaged in uh, they look ahead to the prospect of, a, of an art without artworks, without authorship, and without spectatorship. Uh, he's born in 1963, and he's living still. <laughs> 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 That's a lot we could say. Thanks. Thanks, Walid. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Oops, I don't want to tear this thing. Maybe I should keep my coat healthy. Thank you for this invitation. It's a wonderful... Thank you. Um, wonderful to be here. Um, 
and for this very generous uh, invitation. Um, in in, in a gesture of reciprocity, I, I should say that the title of my talk tonight, um, which is not, not art, is directly inspired by a, an idea of Walid Sadek's uh, several years ago when he was um, editing a special issue of the, of the then um, excellent journal Third Text, um, which has subsequently gone completely downhill, but um, on uh, practices in this region which he very intriguingly um, and thoughtfully entitled Not Not Arab, which I took to be his um, personal but not idiosyncratic um, engagement um, with that assigned ontology, which comes at a great weight of being Arab. But he didn't say, of course, that he's not Arab or that the practices he was engaging with were not Arab. But nor is a double negative exactly an affirmation. Um, it's not not Arab. Well, I won't comment on that uh, title, but I, d I was sufficiently intrigued by it to uh, keep it always in the back of my mind, just awaiting a chance for it to be repurposed, which is sort of the key um, verb of my uh, practice, repurposing it tonight to talk about practices which could be at best be described, I think, as not, not art. Practices, that is, whose conditions of historical possibility, to talk like a philosopher, whose conditions of possibility are grounded in art, but which in and of themselves are not art. So practices which rely on there being art that art is in the world, or has been in the world, but which they themselves are not part of, at least not in the conventional sense of the term. Although perhaps their self-understanding is grounded in art. So practices whose coefficient of artistic visibility is uh, so low that we would not uh, necessarily assign them that ontology. We would not say, this is art. Um, but nevertheless, that without art, they could not exist. So this is not about the death of art or about its disappearance um, in, a, in a tragic sense, but actually about how many practitioners today, it seems to me, at least this is the, has been my research agenda um, in recent years, have um, been able to give art a renewed lease on life. And not only a renewed lease on life, but have somehow sundered art from itself from its conventional understanding, have escaped that um, performative and ontological capture as art for some reason. Who have, that is, decide, decided de to deliberately withdraw from the mainstream attention economy into the shadows. Opposing, that is, a kind of shadow ecology to the attention economics of the mainstream. And of course, when I say attention economics, I'm thinking of the dominant form of uh, accumulation, dominant accumulation strategy in contemporary uh, capitalism. That is one where attention has become itself uh, a form of capital, which can then be reinvested and capitalized upon again. Now, uh, the mainstream art world might fancy that it was in a position to critique attention economics, uh, to denounce it somehow, uh, to challenge it, to represent it and ironize about it, or hold a cynical relationship towards it. All these are strategies which he, we could put names to. right? But I think that the mainstream art world is all the less equipped to do something like that, as it has been the testing ground for attention economics uh, over the past generation. So that the places where a attention gathering, attention garnering, attention holding, and attention reinvesting are precisely those strategies, strategies which were first developed in the art world before being uh, applied to the more general economy. So in some respects, I think this is my, bluntly, my basic hypothesis, is this is the reason why so many practitioners today are deciding, rather than maximizing their coefficient of artistic visibility, which is what the attention economy would 
um, demand of them, have deliberately impaired it. Have differently, deliberately impaired it in order to drop off the radar screens, which are of course calibrated to detect art whose ontology is not only assumed, but is somehow championed, have to drop off those radar screens in order to invest other spaces in our life worlds. That's not quite the end of the story, though I think that, the, that it would be a very paradoxical comment on contemporary subjectivity to say that people were deliberately withdrawing from acknowledgement and, re and recognition without offering some kind of an explanation. And I don't think I will have time actually to go into the details of that explanation here because that's a, a different lecture and I want to talk about essentially examples of this tonight. But so suffice it to say that when um, the, con the architecture, the conceptual architecture of art as we understand it today emerged in mid 18th century Europe uh, around such thinkers as uh, Diderot and particularly in my um, conceptualization of things around Immanuel Kant, it, a ton of what would become autonomous art practice, that is, art which was tolerably free from political and theological oversight, uh, had to be premised on two things, uh, which remain the, key, the cornerstones um, of both the conceptual architecture and, of course, the physical architecture of where art takes place in our societies now on a global scale. And those are, on the one hand, that art is characterized, unlike any other human activity, by its purposeless purpose. That's a quotation from Immanuel Kant. Its purposeless purpose. In other words, art is not useless. It's not purposeless. It has a purpose. And that is its purposelessness. So it's a beautifully paradoxical kind of spiral, or circularity, but a very sturdy one, apparently, because I think that in a world today where uh, we find ever more um, uh, pervaded by uh, utilitarian rationality and um, underscored by cost-benefit analysis, many people and many well-thinking and sincere people within the art world are prepared to defend autonomous art on precisely these grounds, that it's good at, in a world so hell-bent on this utilitarianism to have something, at least, which is not. Um, engaged in this, and so the, hence the defense of art as a, as a place for the free play of the human faculties. However, I think that comes at a tremendous cost, because the other thing that Kant lined art up with, on the purposeless purpose on the objective side, but of course since art is always something which is subjectively engaged with, he, the subjective uh, engagement he qualified as based on disinterested spectatorship. The spectator as introducing thereby, of course, a new heroical figure into the, into the equation. Um, and a spectator as a judge. In the end, Kant really wasn't particularly interested in art per se. He was interested in establishing um, the conditions for judgment, um, disinterested judgment. In other words, judgment which was not just vengeance, but was actually um, somehow uh, objective. Um, but that comes at a great cost, and it comes at the cost of, well, we might ask ourselves, well, what do these things have in common? What does disinterested spectatorship share with purposeless purpose? You know, what was, when Kant was talking about that, what was he anxious about excluding? And I think the answer to that, which has been kind of the buzzword of my um, research, has been he was interested in excluding what I call usership. That art should not be something um, that engages with users and usership, because he felt that, of course, in that case, um, interest would be reintroduced, and not only interest, but opportunism, and, uh, and use value, and the rights of use, and so on. But of course, and understandably, uh, but once again, we can see that this, is, this will, in the end, have to produce some sort of intractable contradiction, if not, indeed, um, paradox. Is that better with the lights on? Yeah. <coughs> Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. It's the Enlightenment. Um, uh, and I think that the, that the contradiction there is that art was constantly in a position where it was betraying its own promises, its perhaps overblown promises, about being a force able to engage in world transformation. That art was not able to change the world. It actually could not have bite, traction, purchase on the real. Um, but in fact would inevitably have to operate at somehow on a reduced scale with respect uh, to the world. And I suspect that, to be very brief about this, that the, that the fundamental um, reason 
that so many practitioners today, and of course not the ones that you would hear about for, by definition, right, in the, in the official organs of contemporary art like Art Forum and uh, Art Press and, and, and the other specialized um, journals, uh, why so many are withdrawing from the attention economy to the shadows is in the hope of in, engaging um, more um, bitingly with the real and fulfilling some of um, art's um, as yet unfulfilled promises. So this is about, so not not art is of course, it's all about art. I actually think of the definition of not not art, and I'm skipping ahead but I'll come back to this right at the end, is the gift that art gives to itself. I'm just gonna, my friends know that I'm very inclined to quote the Canadian songwriter and poet Leonard Cohen in my daily oratory. So I'd like to play you a 20 second clip from a very beautiful uh, song of his called the uh, Chelsea Ho no Hotel Number no. 2, which you probably know, but I'd like you to listen to the, the words um, of this particular passage. Okay, now what's that all about? Um, you got away, didn't you, babe? You just, just got away from the crowd. You got away, I never once heard you say, I need you, I don't need you, I need you, I don't need you, and all of that jiving around. That's kind of the, the um, way I want to um, frame what I'm gonna talk about now, um, as if, Cohen was somehow addressing himself to art. Because that's precisely what, in this um, piece that I want to comment on, first of all, uh, the Zagreb conceptualist Mladen Stilinovich did in a, in a 1999 letter, love letter, which he wrote to art. Actually, it's not so much a love letter as a kind of a letter of solace to an old friend in a pinch. So he talks about he says, Dear Art, I'm writing you a love letter to cheer you up and encourage you to come and visit me sometime. So it might sound like he's actually calling out to his muse, but this is not it at all. It's a, it's a one and a half page letter, we won't look at it. It's the sort of thing you can find online. I think I even posted it somewhere myself. But it's a little bit further down in the, in the, in the letter that he says something which I found, well, very much akin to what Leonard, what Leonard Cohen was singing, but also very much akin to this idea of uh, dropping off the radar screens. Uh, he says, um, they use your name too often so that you don't know anymore whether this is your name. I hear you're trying to find a new name, but remember Shakespeare, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. You'll smell sweet, even you'll stink. The name has nothing to change here. I know that these huge sums of money that are given for your name, which you are not, get on your nerves. I think the time has come for you to hide yourself and keep a low profile for a while. Just tell me where, so that people will no longer be able to find you so easily. This is a difficult operation, and a very risky one. But it might be worthwhile to try. Perhaps they'll even forget you. Then you'll be free, completely. So we know this argument, right, is that sometimes these types of practices which we, or we, perhaps the royal we, the types of practices in any case that I'm looking at, um, are so um, at odds with the formatting of the mainstream attention economy art world that I actually do wonder whether art is the appropriate term. Isn't it perhaps appropriate to think of a different word that perhaps does not assign that artistic ontology to them? That, that deals with them more appropriately on their own terms. This is a real debate, of course, uh, and that it's true that 
uh, that word, that three-letter word, art, is so fraught with such a, uh, a differentiated semantic burden that sometimes it doesn't seem to really capture anything. Huh? But on the other hand, personally, I'm always kind of loath to give up the notion of art, hence these rather uh, convoluted expressions like not not art, um, because art has a long history and I don't see any reason to, um, to yield uh, the monopoly on that history to those whose use of that term I find personally so problematic. So changing the name, as Delinovich then suggests in this artwork, um, this rather modest artwork in the form of a letter, uh, is perhaps not the solution, but perhaps it's the, in the second part of that quote, which I mentioned here, it's perhaps a more escapological move which is required. And to be honest, I think that this is, a, this is one of the terms which I use to describe the current moment um, of history. I, I believe that not only in art, but um, in many other respects as well, including in many um, walks of, um, of political engagement and thinking, we are living an escapological moment. An escapological moment by escapology, of course, I don't mean so much that Houdini-like figure who can escape from any kind of a, a barrel in which he's been confined, although that the image of, of a Harry Houdini is a, um, it, it does provide a, um, I guess, a, a colorful and, and, and a quite an engaging um, image. But even within, even within pop culture, I notice that the the fascination with uh, evasion and the escape of capture has never been greater. Escape from what exactly? Well, escape certainly, um, I think all artists, and even in those who are engaged within the attention economy, um, believe that there is something to this need to escape. But it just depends on escaping what. What type of capture are we talking about? Well, I think that many artists would certainly agree that there is a need to escape from um, ideological capture. And of course, sometimes the best way to escape ideological capture is to, like the purloined letter of Edgar Poe, is to uh, over-identify with the, with the superego of the art world and to uh, run right into its face, uh, over-identifying with its own structures to such an extent that it renders them invisible and therefore neutralizes in some respect, at least according to that line of thought, the, uh, the power of that, um, of that capture. Another type of capture which is often um, which is more ambivalent, is that of institutional capture. Of course, the mainstream um, artist would think the best thing possibly to do is to ensure institutional capture, right? Ensure that one is captured by the powerful um, institutional and institutional market forces, right? the biennials, the documentas, the manifestas, all these events within the mainstream attention economy ensure, to ensure that one is captured by them. But of course, that's very much a double-edged sword, and there is the uh, definitely the attempt to stay off of that, um, uh, that screen and at least to have some kind of oversight over the type of uh, um, capture and hence visibility um, that one has uh, as an artist. Beyond that, there are other forms of captures but which become, I think, even more problematic, at least for the type of practices we're discussing here, is the now omnipresent form of performative capture. Well, and of course, the the completely inflationary use of the notion of performativity um, in general. By performative capture, of course, I don't mean capture as a performance, not as a performed capture, uh, but as uh, being performed as art. Uh, and when something is performed as art, uh, when this is art, that is a form of performative capture, then we can speak also of a kind of ontological capture. So something is captured um, thus uh, ontologically. Now, the notion of capture itself is something um, that perhaps we, sh we could say something about before moving on to the next examples, um, is that there is a kind of strange um, cause and effect relationship between escape and capture. Uh, in a certain sense, in a certain logical sense, we would say, well, first there is escape, and of course, then there's capture. But in another way, of course, there is always already escape. Uh, and there is only, uh, but it's only determined as such once the capture mechanisms come into play. And I think that the type of 
logic at work within this seeking to escape that moment of capture is a profound desire to avoid a kind of um, event-based capture. And here, I read a very interesting text recently um, uh, by Angela about the, perhaps not an extremely recent text, but recently published text about the, um, the desire of many practitioners today to try to avoid a representational paradigm uh, rather than seeing politics, let's say, as something that could be the object of content, uh, whether immediate content, uh, political events, and something can be used as a material and a plasticity uh, in, in the creation of the artwork, or something that could be um, seen at a greater distance, but to replace those types of representational paradigms by the idea of art as event, per se. But as, as much as I think that analysis um, is correct, I actually think that this is precisely what is happening. I think that the description is correct. I think that art historians and art critics, and particularly left-leaning art historians and critics, have accustomed us to see art as an event. Not to see it, uh, to see certainly its manifestations as event, huh? its publications, uh, its um, exhibitions, its performances, um, uh, and so on and so on, as events, but art itself is somehow construed as an event. Well, the type of art which I'm talking about here, which can be described best as not not art, as best, if I may say, which I can't think of how to describe better than that, uh, is an attempt to avoid this type of performative and ontological capture and to avoid the event per se. So I'm talking about practices which are radically imperformative. By imperformative, I certainly do not mean uh, powerless. In fact, this is all about trying to find more traction and more purchase within the real. But at the price, uh, because there's always a conceptual price for these things, at the price of deliberately impairing and losing that coefficient uh, of artistic visibility. The problem with event that I have, in a sense, is that events, events are never present to us as such. Events are those those moments where the otherwise uh, calm surface of the present is somehow uh, pierced and, uh, and the attendant causality is ruptured uh, with all the attendant fireworks that go with that. But I see that as a, actually I see that as a quite a masculinist version of historical process and of art historical process in particular. Because it seems to me that that is describes so little of what really goes on within the day-to-day -day practice um, of artistic activity. That, that there's a kind of a masculinist bias there. For those who have the leisure either to look back upon events in the past, which took place and which ruptured causality, or have the leisure to wait around for the event to transpire at some future point. But meanwhile, in the present, what's going on? What's going on in the shadows? Uh, cast, cast by the, the projectors of the limelight of the attention economy, of the event economy, of the event society. What's going on and what is the ecology of those events, that 99%, if you like, of artistic activity which is going on in the shadows? So, in opposition to that kind of rather ejaculatory model of the event, I'm thinking of something which is uh, like a yeast or uh, a, an agent of fermentation which is fomenting beneath the surface. And this, um, these are the practices which, which I want to um, talk about immediately right, right now. Let's talk about the one that um, was on the screen earlier. Um, I, was, I talk about this one be first because I was asked to provide an image for the, um, to announce this event. Um, and I chose this one. Um, this is the, um, probably a, an art historical episode which you're not familiar with. Um, and there, that could be easily um, understood, though perhaps some of you are. The chances are that if you are, it's because you heard me talking about it, though. Um, because it's not something which has been abundantly documented, although I do think it is one of the most um, exciting um, shadow uh, art operations um, of, of, recent, of recent times. It's a story of, um, of an Estonian-born American artist by the name of Raivo Pusemp. 
Raivo Pusemp uh, was born in Estonia, but at a very early age moved to New York City, and he then, uh, he was born actually uh, in, the, in the 1940s um, and grew up uh, in the 50s in the United States. Uh, and he went to art school in the early 1960s in Salt Lake City, where he was actually in the same class as Paul McCarthy. That's not just, um, uh, well, that's anecdotal, but I'm saying it for a particular reason. Uh, when, they, when they graduated uh, with their MFAs in the mid-60s, um, they realized that there was no hope for doing anything in that Mormon-infested town, so uh, McCarthy went to Los Angeles and Pusep went back to New York. And Pusep was, uh, became immediately very successful as an artist. He became very successful as an artist doing what he re referred to at the time as his discovery pieces, uh, which were forms of uh, sort of conceptual sculpture. Uh, which I won't really talk about too much, but uh, he was one of these artists, which, and this is an interesting point, I think, is that who, um, rather like a, which is described by the uh, French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, not talking about Poussin, but in general, about someone who had an uncanny ability to read at any point uh, the configuration in the field. Uh, he had a kind of a habitus, as Bourdieu would say, with respect to what was going on in the field. Like a star football player, for example, who's never seen the exact configuration of players and ball on the, on the field, anything like it, just right now, knows in a kind of pre-reflexive way where he should be when to uh, do what he needs to do. And Poussin was kind of like that. He could read the uh, horizon of expectations of that art world of those days, and he could immediately respond to it in a very successful way that would appeal both to the specialized press, which would appeal to uh, collectors and gallerists and so on. So it was, he, he became very quickly very successful. But of course, for someone like that, that type of success is too facile and therefore not very interesting. All but less interesting, actually, for Poussin, because he had this very strange experience that he would be going out with his um, fellow artist buddies in the evening, and what would they be doing? They'd be saying, oh, you know, the art world, it's all corrupt, and it's like, it's who you're sleeping with, and it's cronyism, and it's, you know, how frustrated artists are, right? They talk, about, talk like that. And then Poussin, of course, would be saying, well, no, guys, it's not like that at all. You just do anything. It always works. Everything works. I mean, it's just, a, it's just amazing. You just do anything, and they like it. And they're going, yeah, you know, right? You know, forget that. It's not true. You're just saying that. Who are you sleeping with? You know, sort of thing. So... Um, so this is when uh, the interesting part of this story begins. This is then, um, we move from his physical sculpture pieces uh, down, uh, so that was, he was doing those between 65 and 69. He says to 1970 here, but I think it was a little bit earlier than that. Um, and this group that he was drinking beer with and having these um, rather lopsided conversations with was a, a group which actually I'm researching now, which is, it turns out to be a very interesting group, which is called the Museum group, a museum, a museum for living artists, as they called themselves. It was quite a, a broad group. So Poussin decided, came upon an idea with respect to the situation, and he called them his influence works or his conceptual seed plants. Here's how it works. Um, and you can see that we're already now moving, you'll see that this is the first step into moving towards uh, off the radar screen directly, is that Poussin, um, somewhere between the seventh and the eighth beer of the evening, Raivo Poussin would very discreetly slip into the conversation an idea for doing an artwork that if someone did it, they would obtain acknowledgement and recognition uh, of, the, of the art world. He would, he would seed that idea in such a way as that if anyone did remember it the next morning, which they probably wouldn't, but if they did, they definitely wouldn't remember how it got into the conversation. And his idea was that if someone took one of those ideas up and realized it and obtained recognition, which he could independently verify in the press, that he would consider that his work was done. So he wouldn't think that what they did and for which they obtained recognition was his work. No, his work was what he called the conceptual seed plant. So, I find this an absolutely fascinating uh, and very poetic uh, modus operandi. I probably find that that way also because as an instructor, sometimes uh, all I think other instructors will recognize this, but probably anyone who's ever been in a conversation will recognize this, is that sometimes the ideas which we put out there into the world, which we seed, um, mostly they don't go anywhere because mostly nobody's listening. But sometimes someone hears one of them. And you can never know how they're going to hear it. But sometimes that seed will be planted 
it will be nurtured and it will grow and it will bear fruit. And sometimes that fruit will be delicious. So this kind of permaculture of ideas is really the way human communication works. And in this particular case, it was practiced as an, as an artwork. Very interesting, and there will be a lot to say about it, but it's the next step that easily becomes more interesting. Pusemp is one of these artists who has a way of progressively radicalizing his practice by progressively uh, impairing still further its coefficient of artistic visibility. At a certain point, he said, mm, after two years, after two years, and after being able to d document five or six cases of where his seed plants had actually borne fruit, unbeknownst to his interlocutors. But that was just the problem. After two years, he said, this whole thing is a big problem because it smacks of manipulation. I know something about what these people are doing that they cannot know about themselves. And after all, they're my friends. I've got to stop. So he stopped. He stopped, but he did ask himself a further question. He said, is there not some walk or avenue of human activity in which um, this type of, where manipulation is actually morally acceptable and even politically necessary? And he said, yep, politics. Politics. And so it was at this point that rival Poussemp became a politician as a conceptual and collective art project. How did that work? Well, this is in 1975. Um, he's living in upstate New York at this time, teaching at an art academy. He's living in a town called Rosendale. Uh, now, Rosendale was one of the original townships on the east coast of the United States, which was founded in the 17th century, so very long um, history. Um, but it sort of was the uh, absolute symptom of everything that was wrong of the, with the United States in those years, which was still bound up with the, with the war um, in South Asia, and Vietnam in particular. And a society very much pitted against itself with, on the one hand, rednecks pitted the let's go to war type uh, rednecks pitted against the hippies, right? So the, the town, because of this situation, um, was kind of going to the dogs. It was beleaguered with debt. Um, the infrastructure was collapsed. The roadways were filled with potholes. The water purification system didn't work. The sewers were backing up. Everything was wrong. The police were corrupt, you name it. So he knew that, especially if you're called Poussamp, you can't just run for mayor and say what has to be done. Well, because the only thing that everybody who looked at it objectively would know that had to be done was that it had to be dissolved, legally speaking, and amalgamated into a local municipality of the same name. But of course, that, to say that would have been heresy. He couldn't say it. So he ran for mayor as an artist, um, not telling anyone that he was considering this as an art project. Um, and not telling anyone that his plan was to dissolve Rosendale, but ran on an upbeat campaign that he was going to fix these things about the town. And he was elected. And that's just exactly what he did. He started fixing things. He, he fixed the corrupt police force. He fixed the potholes in the roadways. I mean, he didn't do it. He had the municipal workers do it. Um, he organized a serious improvement of the town's infrastructure. But little by little, at every opportunity, just as they'd done with his beer drinking buddies, he would discreetly slip into the conversation uh, with the, the townspeople that perhaps the best thing to do would imagine a kind of legal dissolution. And little by little, the idea gained currency, as he gained legitimacy. And he applied this with the kind of protocol that he had learned from being a conceptual artist. And after two years, in 1977, he called a referendum. And the idea of dissolution was plebiscited with 72% of the votes. So an idea which would have been inconceivable two years earlier all of a sudden received a massive plebiscite. The next day, of course, he resigned as mayor and left Rosendale forever, withdrawing still further into the shadows uh, of um, away from an attention economy, and, and continues uh, his practice today um, in a much more remote uh, location, which we won't maybe have time to talk about, but which is also very, even more interesting, much more radical. But let's stop just there. He now says that he lived the, the, that moment as a kind of secret agent, or he lived, as it were, a kind of double life. Not because he was sleeping with somebody other than his wife, but because he was engaged in an artistic practice that was not being uh, divulged as such, or disclosed as such. He only was able to tell two people. He told his wife, 
She had no particular thoughts on that. She knew what kind of guy he was. Um, and he told his friend Paul McCarthy, who was horrified. Paul McCarthy said, if you want art to be political, it's got to be visible, man. That's how art works. That's the politics of art. That's the, what's, what, why do we call it visual art, after all? Because it's, it's visual. What are you doing? You're, doing? you're operating in the shadows. You're operating clandestinely. You're operating like a secret agent. Underground. And, well, who was right? How did it, I mean, if, uh, it's, it's a difficult call, right? I mean, certainly the art world and the mainstream attention economy goes with the McCarthy analysis. McCarthy is one of those artists, of course, who does engage in precisely what I was talking about before, with over-identifying with the superego of the society. But Poussin had just exactly the opposite strategy. And in the end, McCarthy had to admit that it was pretty successful as a political operation and in its secondary ontology, if you like, as a, thank you very much, as a, uh, an artistic operation. Now, it remains to be understood whether it actually has this double ontology at all. Actually, whether it has an ontology as an artwork. Well, in a sense, since I'm talking to you about it tonight, and I'm showing you these documents, in a sense, are we not looking at a kind of um, ontological assignment as art, something that pe perhaps certainly the people of Rosendale didn't know about, but now you know about. Now, I think that it would be more useful, and I can't develop entirely the whole theoretical uh, background that goes with this, but I would think it would be more useful rather than talking about it having an artistic ontology when everything about it is deontologizing, to talk about a certain coefficient of art. We could say that in this room tonight, now, the coefficient of art is far higher than it was in Rosendale in those days. Far higher, because it was negligible in Rosendale. Um, but is it actually ontologized as art? Does art have to exist as an ontology? Or can it not simply exist as an energy beneath the surface uh, as, a, as a force uh, to be contended with? It's interesting to uh, raise those questions, and it's also interesting to raise the question, well, how the heck do we know about this thing, and what is this he up here? Well, the thing is that you will see that this this is actually the back page of a, of a document which was, um, which was put together several years later in 1980 um, because at the time uh, McCarthy said to Poussin, he said, uh, but you know that thing you did when you were mayor and all that weird shit? Um, it's like, people don't know about that and it's going to be lost to posterity. You've, what, don't you want to talk about that? And Poussin, of course, didn't care about talking about it. But, he, but McCarthy said, well, listen, I've got this, this publishing house. It's called Highland Art Agents. They published like artist books and stuff. He said, why don't we like talk about it? And so Poussin said, okay, because actually when I was mayor, I clipped out all the little articles in the local press. And I, I, uh, so it looks kind of like this. Let's see, how does this work? So it looked kind of like this. Uh, it's about a 36 page um, collection of letters that he'd exchanged with uh, uh, members of Congress, um, with local uh, dignitaries, the minutes of the municipal council meetings, um, you name it. Never once in all the 36 pages, of course, is the word art mentioned, because why would it be? It was never acknowledged that that's what it was about. And it's prefaced by a very nice little, um, a very short uh, description of the, of the, the project by, by Raivu Pusimp himself. And it's presented this way, called Beyond Art, Dissolution of Rosendale, New York, a public work by Raivo Pusemp. Uh, so this is something um, which was, I think was pub uh, published in exactly 400 copies, um, one of which I was able to obtain and then scanned and have uploaded. So if these sort of things interest you, you can find it now um, on, the, um, on the internet. Um, but the status, of course, of this particular document is extremely interesting because it is the only way through which uh, the artistic coefficient are, uh, can be boosted in a certain sense and can be indeed activated. Right? So this is a case of the artist as double agent or a secret agent, someone operating um, off the radar in the, in, the, um, in the shadow cast by the attention economy, operating under a different ontology and deliberately doing so uh, in order to gain some kind of greater purchase and use value within the real. Let's look at a much more contemporary example, uh, a very humorous one. I don't want to look at too many examples, but um, am I okay for time? 
15 minutes, okay, perfect. Um, here's an example from Paris, um, where I'm based, um, two years ago. Uh, this is a, uh, an image which was taken in the catacombs um, on the east, uh, on the south bank of the, of the city. Uh, it says, La Mexicaine de Perforation was here. La Mexicaine de Perforation, it's a very strange name, um, is actually uh, one of the uh, wings of a group called uh, Lux, which is, uh, stands, stands for Urban Experiments. And the group um, Urban Experiments uh, is a group which operates literally underground. Uh, in clandestinity, certainly, but literally underground, um, and was, is probably best, best known for a work, which we will look at right here. That's, that's a book which they subsequently published, uh, published by one of their members who refers to himself as Lazar Kunstmann, of all things. Um, and this is a project which they uh, initiated uh, before the one which I'm gonna talk about in a second. Um, on the right bank, underneath the Palais de Chaillot, where they gained access to the, the considerable network of catacombs, 300 kilometers in the city of Paris, and underneath the, the Palais de Chaillot built a clandestine uh, movie house, uh, which they ran for several months, um, and which they set up with a bar, which you can see here, which they set up with a film projector, and here you have one of their um, uh, the, uh, screenings, uh, which they ran there before uh, they were discovered, um, and the operation was shut down uh, by the police. But this was a project which, uh, and the first film that they screened, I think, of course, appropriately enough, would have been um, Chris Marker's uh, La Jeté, which also was set in this very uh, same catacomb. <clears throat> uh, so this is an interesting and kind of humorous, uh, user-friendly sort of a practice, but it's not the one that I'm most interested in, um, but in this one. Um, that these guys are kind of specialists in gaining access to places which are not um, uh, deemed to be accessible. Uh, but one of the places where the La Mexicaine de Perforation liked to operate was in the Panthéon, which is considered one of the most prestigious public monuments in, in Paris. Um, they gained access to it and they would regularly stage in the, in the late evening uh, when the place was closed. Uh, they would uh, plays and performances and, and such thing. And at a certain point, they realized that the clock, this beautiful 18th century clock, which was at the, uh, at the very top of the, of the Pantheon, uh, wasn't working. And one of the members, the one you see here, actually was a, a clockmaker. And uh, so one evening, they went up there and looked at the clock. And they realized that, in fact, the reason the clock didn't work was that it had been deliberately vandalized by someone and then it was determined that the person who had vandalized it was the watchman hired by the Monument de France whose job it was to walk up the 13 flights of stories every day to wind the clock. And in order to avoid himself that um, <coughs> arduous task, he took a hammer to it one day and then told his boss, it doesn't work, and so that was the end of that. But because it had been sitting idle and it had been accumulating dust for so long, it was in serious danger of um, being, becoming irreparably damaged. So they took upon, the Lux took it upon it themselves to clandestinely repair this piece of um, national heritage. So over a two month, um, no, I'm sorry, two months, two year uh, period, they set up a very festive kind of a workshop on the 13th floor of the Pantheon. And uh, the clockmaker put together a specialized team of um, uh, clock repair people, and they actually fully repaired and refurbished that clock. So this is a very paradoxical form of usership of um, public uh, monuments, right? It's because, it, and it's extremely counterintuitive, it's kind of hard. When I first heard it, I thought, okay, am I understanding this backwards? What did I just hear exactly? Well, what, that's sort of the question that the director of the monument asked himself as well. Um, when, once they had repaired the clock, they went and revealed, in this kind of um, delayed disclosure tactic, they revealed what they had done to the director and to his um, assistant. And, of course, the director was dumbfounded. He could not believe that people who had gained access to his um, museum had, instead of vandalizing it and stealing things, had actually repaired this, um, this wonderful um, heirloom. The assistant director, however, was less impressed and he called the police and had them arrested. They were taken to court. They explained what I just explained, probably in much greater detail. And the judge said, 
I'm sorry, if I understand anything about what I've just been told, that it would seem to me that the defendant should be in the, uh, the prosecution's box and the uh, accusers should be here on trial. <laughs> Case dismissed, right? So they got off on that. But it does raise this extremely interesting and rather playful sense of um, how sometimes to engage in certain types of operations, and of course we can think of countless other and better known examples like the Yes Men and, and all their acolytes today around the Yes Lab, how sometimes it is important and necessary to deliberately impair one's coefficient of artistic visibility to have some kind of, um, kind of bite, some kind of traction. Here's a very, from a different, entirely different walk of um, life. This will be the, the third and last one which I'll show and then we'll take one last example to wind this up. Um, this, this is a case um, also very light, unlikely that you would know this, but perhaps if, um, it's one of the examples which I like to talk about. It's the, it takes place in Argentina. Um, eh, this, this little image was taken in a supermarket in, in, in Buenos Aires. A little bit of background here is that uh, you probably know that um, as the civil war waged here in Lebanon, uh, there was also terrible um, conflict uh, in, Ar in Argentina, just about in the same years. Uh, there was a terribly brutal military dict dictatorship that came to power in 1976. Um, 30,000 people from civil society were disappeared. Not that they did disappear, they were actively disappeared. Most of them were uh, tortured, uh, drugged, loaded onto airplanes, flown out over the South Atlantic and thrown out of the bay doors of the airplane. Into, um, into the ocean where they were devoured by sharks or their bodies were, were disappeared. Then when there was a return to democracy, um, there was a law called uh, the Punto Final, in other words, uh, amnesty for everybody. Uh, amnesty, I guess, for the dead people, but also amnesty for the people who had committed the atrocities. Um, and it was only in 2005, with the, when the Kirchner government came to power, that human rights um, activists were able to prevail on the government to change, to rescind that law, and to actively uh, prosecute um, the per perpetrators of the genocide, as it's called in Argentina. Um, and on, in 2006, the first of those um, put on trial was to be sentenced. And on the evening, of his sentencing, one of the key witnesses, one of the few people who actually had been arrested during the dictatorship but how, had managed somehow to survive, this is a very rare kind of a person but very key witness in this case, disappeared. He was disappeared. And this is in democracy, right? This is 2006. And so if there was like a hue and cry in Argentina, right? Because it, and it became known as, the guy's name was um, Julio Lopez. And it became known as the second disappearance of Julio Lopez. And there was huge demonstrations because it was clear that the government, the democratic government, was unable to ensure the protection of the citizens if they spoke out against these still active, obscure forces within the society. Um, but after a while, since they never found Julio Lopez, yeah, the demonstration, people moved on to other stuff, the demonstration stopped, he kind of, he kind of, underwent a third disappearance. It's called, and it's known as the third disappearance of Julio Lopez, the disappearance from public memory and from public media. So there was a, now Julio Lopez was very, was a humble man. He was not a political leader. He was a, a mason, uh, a, a construction worker by trade. And um, perhaps for this reason that the, um, the practitioner whose hands are holding this bottle here um, is a plumber. And his name is uh, Hugo Vidal. Uh, Hugo Vidal said to himself that he would do what he could on his scale to ensure that the memory of uh, Julio Lopez remained in the public ear. And while well, he didn't have access to huge media, he didn't have, um, you know, he's not someone who speaks out per se in the press. But what he what he, as a kind of a conceptual artist plumber, I mean, he's a, professionally he's a plumber, but he also sees himself as, I guess, as a kind of a conceptual artist or a conceptual art-related practitioner. He was struck by the fact that the number one table wine in Argentina is called Lopez. Of course, the number one name in Argentina in all the Spanish-speaking world is Lopez. It's like Smith in English. But he was struck by this free signifier that he would, like, was in his face every time he went to buy some red wine for lunch. <laughs> 
Um, and so drawing upon an art historical reference, which is that of Silda Morales, of course, the Brazilian conceptualist from the 1980s, um, who would, would stamp uh, Coca-Cola bottles and then reintegrate them into the recycling system. He would like put a, a message as a, an art-inspired um, gesture on a Coca-Cola bottle and then reinsert into what he called an ideological circuit. Uh, typically, these were very um, anti-imperialist uh, messages which, which he would put there. And he would also put them on banknotes and then put the banknote back into circulation with the idea that at some point someone would get that banknote. They might or might not see it and they might or might not know what to do with it if they did see it. So what uh, Hugo Vidal did here, and this is the difference between this image and the next one, is that he made a little stamp. He, without asking anyone's particular permission, would go into supermarkets and stamp this above the ready-made slogan, Aparicion con vida de Julio, which means appearance alive, or in, if still alive, of Julio. And then he would allow the punchline uh, to be performed by the brand name itself, Lopez, right? And he, uh, every time he does this, he keeps a track of how many bottles. So he does it every day. And he typically goes to a supermarket and he stamps all the Lopez bottles which they have, takes one for his own um, lunch hour, and then uh, leaves the, stop, the shop. So over the years, he's actually filled a, a kind of a, a, a notebook with a great number of uh, of, of, in, of interventions. Now, I want to bring this, so it's very, very modest and it has a kind of a, in the very modesty of it, uh, and the very um, off the radar, uh, let's say, injection of conceptual competence into an unexpected arena, I find extremely compelling. But what I also find is that somehow there's a real comparison to be made between this work, although you wouldn't think so perhaps, and the work of Rival Pusimp. What's that comparison? Well, my, um, and I'm saying this particularly because Walid has asked me to address this point, is that it's, for me, their commonality, although there would seem to be a disparity in terms of um, spectacle. I mean, Poussin was the mayor, you know, a publicly elected figure, and this is an intervention in a supermarket. But at the same time, I would say that they share this, is that they both operate on the one-to-one -one scale. They have, they have ramped up their um, scale of operations to the one-to-one. -one. And this is the common element, I would say, of practices which I describe as not, not art. Because the conditions of historical possibility for this type of an action depend on some kind of uh, concept art competence moving through there. Uh, the same way that Rival Pusimps did. But the scale is the same in the, in the respect that although one's a supermarket and one is um, a public office, they are inseparable um, from uh, their uh, level of intervention. In other words, they do not operate on a reduced scale the way uh, modernist practices typically did, but actually on a full scale. They both are what they are, and they are propositions of what they are. They're, you might say that they have a double ontology, or you might just say that their coefficient of art is variable according to the circumstances. But in any case, they are what they are, and propositions of what they are. So I'd like to share this last um, document with you, which is not from an artwork, but which is something else. Um, this is a passage from a very wonderful book by Lewis Carroll, published in 1893, called Sylvie and Bruno Concluded. Um, now, it seems an unusual source for this kind of a conversation, but actually I'll think, I hope that you'll see um, where I'm coming from with it. Uh, it's, the, uh, it's the strange and warped tales of the encounter between a British narrator and his girlfriend and uh, a number of characters whom they sort of um, encounter along the way. And in this case, it's a very sort of um, haphazard conversation with someone called Mein Herr, who despite his name, he sounds like he's uh, Germanic, in fact, is more extraterrestrial. I mean, he's outlandish, but he's really otherworldly at the same time. But they hit upon the uh, discussion of um, the pocket map and mapping in general. So I just want to look at this really quickly with you and you'll see that right at the end why um, this actually not only applies, I hope, to the examples which I gave, but applies uh, more broadly to um, artistic practices today which are ramping up their scale of operations. Uh, what a useful thing a pocket map is, I, I remarked. Now, we, I don't want to do too close a reading of this because that would be fastidious, but I would draw your attention to the fact that they're talking about map making from the perspective of use 
that it is useful. So uh, the use function um, or the usological function um, of the map is will occupy them in this conversation. That's another thing we've learned from your nation, said Meinherr, map making. But we've carried it much further than you. What do you consider the largest map that would be really useful? Once again, useful. About six inches to the mile. Right? Only six inches, exclaimed Meinherr. We very soon got to six yards to the mile. Then we tried 100 yards to the mile. And then came the grandest idea of all. We actually made a map of the country on the scale of a mile to the mile. Now, if you're readers of, um, well, Argentinian literature, you will perhaps recall that in the work of Borges, there is a late story from 1962 called On Precision in the Sciences, uh, which tells a very similar story about this, that somewhere in a, in a country um, far, far away, as it were, um, there was a, a series of emperors that commissioned some map makers to build or to construct, to draw a map of the territory on the scale of the country itself. Right? And that uh, with the collapse of the empire, um, that map was abandoned and one still finds uh, traces of it, little pieces of it in the, the westernmost regions of the country where it's used as a kind of blanket or shelter by homeless people and wild animals. And with typical Argentinian melancholy, Borges concludes, but it is the only vestiges of the science of map making or cartography which, which uh, continue to exist. We know, or we can surmise that, uh, because we know that uh, Borges was a reader of Carroll, we can surmise that this is precisely where he took that, um, his inspiration for that um, rather nostalgic little story. But I think that Borges really missed the point here, and he really missed what was most interesting about what Carroll was saying, because here is, for me, the, a series of incredible um, logical moves. Is that, have you used it much, I inquired? Again, the question of, whether it's useful or not, can be used. It has never been spread out yet, said Meinherr. The farmers objected. They said it would cover the whole country and shut out the sunlight. Okay, so this is like extremely interesting, right? So the objection to the map came from the, from the quarter of political ecology, right? The farmers objected because they would said it would block the sunlight. Now that's a super interesting remark when we're talking about the attention economy in the shadows, right? Because obviously map making is the very uh, emblem of the Enlightenment project. I mean, what in the Enlightenment, it, in its white dream, it dreams of maps. Mapping territories which are obscure and which, would, uh, which are so deserving of enlightenment and, and clarification. I mean, that's why we make maps, maps of territories and maps of geophysical spaces, ge maps of uh, cognitive spaces and you name it. It's in order to uh, shed light on them, right? And here it's just exactly the opposite. This is with typical Carolian twist, right? Is that every light shedding device will also cast shadows. What does that say about representation? It's an extremely um, insightful point, I think, that every, everything that will, will actually shed light on something will cast shadows on something else. But here is the clincher. This is, this is, and this is really why I talk about it. So now, so we now use the country itself as its own map, and I assure you it does nearly as well. We use the country itself as its own map. Well, that's exactly, I, I think that one could not find a more succinct um, description of these types of practices which I'm talking about, not not art, uh, uh, than practices which, in essence, use the country itself as its own map. So what we see is that this is not a critique or a suggestion that there's a crisis of representation. Because, of course, they're using, they are making maps. They're using the country as a map. They're not leaving the, uh, the paradigm of representation. But they are using it as its own map. In other words, they are making a kind of an, an indistinguishable uh, link between uh, what it is and what it's, uh, its representation. So use the country itself as its own map is for me uh, the way in which I describe these types of, these types of practices. Claude Lévi-Strauss in La Pensée Sauvage uh, says that all artwork in essence, he's talking about miniatures. He says, well, all artwork is actually a kind of a miniature. Because even if you have a monumental sculpture by like a Kleis Oldenburg, which actually magnifies a hundredfold uh, everyday objects in public spaces, 
It's still operating, according to Levi-Strauss, as a kind of a miniature because it can never be on the scale of life itself. And I think that precisely um, this crisis of scale has occluded the, or, or, or it's rather the crisis of representation has occluded this crisis of scale, which plagued um, so much modernist practice and inhibited it from gaining purchase and use value. And I think this is precisely what these uh, examples, which I call not, not art, are all about. Now I'm gonna conclude just with um, one uh, last, um, theoretical uh, suggestion is that, <clears throat> to, just to sort of uh, buckle the buckle, as it were, um, is that, well, one might say that in the absence of, um, oh. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> in, in the absence of, um, let's say, of uh, uh, a certain type of, um, <clears throat> of if one forsakes the attention economy and the exhibitions that are attendant to it and all the um, event-laden uh, and spectacle-laden uh, contrivances, then can one really talk about art in the professional sense of the term? Um, and of course you can guess that my answer to that question is that yes indeed it can and it can certainly operate much better, but I think we still have to address that question. So how can we, how can this, um, how can we address this exactly? Well. Perhaps we can take a, an example from, ultimately we can take this um, in the history of ideas uh, from Aristotle, but let's back up slowly. In the 1960s, Noam Chomsky, the linguist, and I'm talking about the Chomsky prior to his, uh, his political um, activist days, the linguist, um, when he was working on speech act theory and generative grammar, proposed a kind of a distinction between what he called um, competence, linguistic competence, and linguistic performance. His idea was that by virtue of being born into a natural language, like French or English or Arabic and so on, a speaker would have an inherent competence to recognize a meaningful or syntactically possible speech act from one which was not. Um, but one need never perform that competence in order for it to exist. One had the option to perform it. I can always perform a speech act, but I would have the competence even in the absence of that performance. In a sense, um, although performance is always an option, to say that it is the only option would be, of course, to say that there is no such thing as competence, that I am only a competent uh, through my speech acts. I cannot formulate one which I do not articulate. Well, of course, we can imagine, I hope, that we can imagine how we might apply this to art. We don't really like to talk about artistic competence uh, anymore. That sounds positively reactionary, right? But of course, I'm not thinking about um, traditionalist kind of skill sets. I'm talking about uh, more um, conceptual competences. But imagine the, drawn, of course, in a kind of a, a looping arrangement from the, it's constantly being nourished by the types of performances which really do take place, huh, which feeds back into uh, a competence in a kind of a loop. But uh, we can imagine that if there is such a thing as artistic competence, it need never be performed, or at least not be performed as an event in the attention economy in order for, for it to exist. In fact, it may be very uh, prejudicial and de detrimental to its uh, intrinsic power to perform it in that way. But perhaps it would be better to allow it to exist in another way or to, or to at least have oversight and control, patience about the time and place in which that competence would be deployed. As I began to investigate that, that um, distinction, which I found um, worked, had some descriptive power with respect to artistic practices that I was looking at, I realized that Chomsky hadn't invented it. Actually, he'd taken it, nothing is really invented in the history of ideas, it's only repurposed. And I realized that what he had done is that he had used, he'd made usership, or he had repurposed an idea that had been put forth by Aristotle. And Aristotle was uh, very clear about, uh, and wrote a great deal about what he called potentiality. He wrote about uh, different types of potentiality, the sort of generic potentiality and uh, what's called um, existing uh, potentiality. Generic pot potentiality is when you say, for example, about a child, um, 
that child has the potential to become an artist or the potential to become president of Lebanon uh, or, or, or something. But in generic, comp uh, ge in generic potential, the, um, the object of that potential has to undergo a transformation in order to fulfill the potential, in order to become actualized. So that, that would mean that the child would have to grow up. And, and therefore undergo this transformation. But within existing uh, potentiality, this is not the case. So you could say um, that um, Lebanon has the potential to elect a president. I mean, it seems that like it's not really about to en enact that potential, but it has the potential, and if it does fulfill that potential, it will not have to change in order to do so. Huh? Or an artist, let's say, um, in, from this perspective of existing potential or potentiality, um, could produce, has the potential to produce an artwork. But for Aristotle, the, the notion of called adu, adunamis, which is potentiality in his terms, is fundamentally indistinguishable from what he calls adunamia, impotentiality. So that, and these are his examples, he says, if you don't accept that there is a fundamental unity between adunamis and adunamia, between potentiality and impotentiality, in other words, the potential to do, but the potential to refrain from doing, then you cannot understand how, for example, an architect, when he's not actually building a building, remains an architect. Or an artist, when he's not actually doing art, is still an artist. So that for Aristotle, there is this fundamental equivalency and embeddedness, mutual embeddedness between impotentiality and potentiality. And I think that we all kind of know that it's only a bad artist who thinks that they are an artist by virtue of doing and making art. But there are lots of artists like that, right? Uh, certainly there is an encouragement to perceive oneself in this way. But I think that every authentic artist, let's say every authentic poet knows that at least in some occasions it is preferable to abstain. That silence is under some circumstances a more poetic response than any poem could be. Right? So that one does not forgo one's being a poet, one's potential um, poetness, by abstention. But I think that the really interesting uh, point comes is the third category which is, becomes logically possible there which is the artist th see the problem with silence is that it's always very ambiguous the problem with not doing or making art as an artistic gesture is that it just looks like not doing art and this is why there's a difference between not not art is that the, the at least in our moment of um, blazing attention economics. That there really is a case to be made, I think, uh, if we want art to fulfill its potential, yeah, to not, not do art. In the sense of foregrounding that impotentiality as a form of potentiality. That competence um, as something which can be, uh, in that sense, uh, enacted. And that's why I said at a certain point, and this, it's precisely on this note that um, I will end or hopefully or begin a, a, a conversation if we have time for that, um, that, that not not art is art's gift to itself. Sorry if I was a bit long. I
That was earlier. And then we found out many years later that actually during those years of <coughs> in which he remained visible as a kind of a retired artist or now an artist turned chess player. He was doing a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So if that, so I want to preface that particular strategy. Uh, with the following question, which is that it seems to me in the, in the examples that you gave, uh, there's the problem when the, the clandestine art activity has to surface either in a, in a publication, in a, mm -hmm. something, someone taking a picture of the man standing the the wine bottle, and the decision was taken somewhere to take it. Yeah, that was me. Docu oh, yeah. Someone documented, right? Yeah. So it seems like one-to-one -one scaled art is intrinsically invisible. There must be this excess, which is the document, to make it visible. Representation is less than one-to-one, -one, therefore it's very visible. Yes. So it seems like we either have less than one-to-one, -one, or we have one-to-one -one plus this necessary excess. Excess. Yeah, you might say that that's even that's a great point. Yeah, um, in the, even in looking at the Lewis Carroll text, I mean, we still have that text in addition to this country where they use the map, the country as its own as its own map. It, it I, I think that this is only the case, um, and I think the you know I show images here because these are like conventions in which we operate. But I think the better way um, to operate here is actually through um, storytelling, a kind of narratorship. Um, and I think actually that it's more powerful, even though I kind of, you know, I like the Pusemp document. And I, and I mean, I do like the, the, these, these documents, but I find that it, the, an oral document or an oral documentation is actually probably um, more powerful and more organic because um, it will hopefully operate as a kind of idea seeding or a conceptual planting. In other words, I put that idea out there or somebody puts it out there and it kind of makes its way organically throughout um, communities. But I think, too, that there are many, many cases of one-to-one um, -one scale practices, in other words, practices that are not not art, um, which are simply not documented and in which there is no excess and, and therefore uh, somehow exist um, even below the the, the surface of any kind of um, documentary capture. So, because, no, because, because you, well, I mean, this is speculation. We can only speculate that they exist. Because, of course, as soon as, this is a typical question that I get is like, aren't you contradicting yourself because you have um, rather studiously uh, performed practices which did everything they could to avoid performative capture? Um, and as you yourself have said, uh, and, and so you have ethically contradicted the, their wish. Well, to, I understand that from a logical perspective, but from an art narrative perspective or an art historical perspective, I would also be loath to leave the, um, the monopoly on art historical narrative to those practices which exist only within the attention economy. So I think that these practices actually, since they provide a second lease and and, and what a lease on life um, to, you know, to art, artistic agency, that I think it would be irresponsible in a sense not to talk about them because they existed. But, but you can see also to what, um, what a precarious or frail uh, degree they exist because they exist basically within these kinds of conversations. I mean, they're not being relayed on a, on a, in a broader um, attention economy. And af after all, the PUSEP document was published in 400 copies in 1980, he still has about 380 of them in his uh, closet. You know, so it's not really out there in the world. Um, I, I'm, I'm mindful of this, of this problem for sure, and I think it's interesting that you put it in the terms of, of excess or, um, or insufficiency. Um, but I, I don't, what I, this is what I wanna do, and um, is that I hope that these, I think that the hope somehow with these types of practices is and I guess it's a hope, is that they will succeed by, um, by seeding and creating a kind of situation of emulation. You know, so that 
art, rather than existing as um, something to be performed, exists as a kind of um, energy that can be um, relayed, you know, rather than surfaced. So, what do you think of the Duchamp strategy, which is that to, to, to work clandestinely, you have to double yourself? One, one of you becomes increasing uh, hyper visible, so yes. that the other part becomes furtive. Yeah, well, um, certainly it's an excellent, I mean, certainly it's one strategy. Uh, What do you think of it? <laughs> what if, uh, from the short example, I mean, th there is a kind of a disappointing conclusion to it, right? Because all the work he did furtively ends up and he gives it to this one museum. So th there is a kind of a resurfacing mm -hmm. into the, I mean, back then it wasn't so, but the, the attention economy, I suppose. Definitely. And, and, and paradoxically, the type of work that he was doing clandestinely was extremely spectatorship oriented. You know, it's a, the Eton Donné is like absolutely about a kind of a very acute focusing on a, you know, a, a constitutive gaze of a subject. Uh, and based on voyeurism and, and all sorts of um, things which, which apparently are completely contradictory to, uh, for a man who said that the artists of the future will go underground, you know. So, uh, you know, I think that the, in a way that um, how can we not take a lot from Duchamp because in a sense he was the artist of the 20th century. I mean, it's not sure that there were other artists really. You know, there were, there were acolytes of Marcel Duchamp, but basically he was the artist of the 20th century, so it's very difficult to not give him some kind of um, credency there. But I think that in a way these are you know what I think is I think that we're often um, today characterized as the nieces and nephews of Marcel Duchamp, and I feel that we're much more the orphans. institution, perhaps also uh, going beyond the conventional understanding of an institution incorporating the Benjaminian notion of the apparatus. Um, and I mean, Duchamp is a very good example in the sense that his withdrawal was not so much a, an anti-institutional stance, uh, but sort of withholding production for a while yes. until it gets exposed. And I mean, I think it's part and parcel of that very gesture to withhold, withhold to give all the works to one museum. Because every work, I mean, there's this general realization that every work, before even it is made, is already made for a museological order, what we could call a museological order. Um, so my question is like whether, you know, in these practices, um, whether the, the issue is sort of um, a critique of art as institution, which I wouldn't reduce them to that, or is it, and we're, we're discussing this in class, or whether it is about um, creating better institutions, in the sense like we have you know, an, an art institution that is not cooptable by, or co-opted by ideological, political, and so on, forces creating a, a room of our own within the existing structure. I think it's much more this latter. Um, I, I would not describe these as um, involved in institutional critique at all, because the paradox of institutional critique, as Andrea Fraser has sort of very frustratingly um, characterized it, is that we cannot get out of the institution because the institution is in us. So that there is n there is no field outside the art field, and she and if you say to her that there is actually, she said no, there are only subfields, you know, which raises that question: Can the subfielder speak? You know. Um, so actually, I think that this. This line of, well, that, at least that second generation of institutional critique is, is not really um, relevant for these types of practices. These are very affirmative practices. These are practices which say, well, you know, I've got these artistic competences. Um, I'm going to inject them into the real. You know, I'm going to do this. Um, and so it's very affirmative. It's not saying this institution is bad. But I, in another way, personally, my personal take on it, and we didn't 
and I would have said this if it had been a more theoretical lecture, is that yes, I don't think we can just allow uh, institutions to go on like this. We need to repurpose them. They need to be repurposed. We, and I mean, the type of institutions which we most urgently need to repurpose, of course, are our central banks. But um, even our artistic institutions you know, require um, urgent. We cannot, op it's, it's, it's fabulous to work in an institution. It can be fabulously frustrating as well. But it's fabulous what institutions can make happen, right? Your institution made it possible for me to be here, so I don't. I don't like. I'm not like spitting in the soup, you know. Uh, but I think that, and I'm not talking about this institution, but our, our the artistic, um, let's say the, the conceptual architecture of our artistic institutions needs to be um, rethought so that we can rethink the conceptual edifices and the physical edifices in which art takes place. Because for now, since their cornerstones is purposeless purpose and disinterested spectatorship, we are operating within a logic of display. And so for practices which do not require display but require some completely different way of operating within social spaces, they just don't work. So they, they will have always already formatted the practices for their, um, their, their parameters. And we, I don't think we can stand with our you know, hands at our sides while, while this goes on because it will just be the endless repetition of the same. Yeah, and also what is I mean, interesting is that in your theorization, uh, when you say not, not art, you know, not, not, it still remains within the conceptual parameters of art. And not quite, you know, so, so the resources of negation are conceptually also drawn from, from art and I'm, also it was kind of important that you grounded these practices in a certain like certain competence, certain pool of competencies mm -hmm. that are also artistic. So they're not like merely social practices no. or political interventions or no, no, they're not. I mean, and and um, it's not that I'm disinterested in those things, but they're not the object of my research. I really am interested in what art can do when it when it um, when it goes fallow. You know, when it goes to seed, when it leaves the the controlled conditions of its um, visibility and does something else. And so this is why I I do stick to the idea that I see what you mean that there is there is still kind of a conceptual capture because it's, it's art, you know? But I, I think, uh, I'm interested in, in, in thinking about this as in terms of a kind of a historical interruption rather than a rupture. So not saying, that, that was Stalinovich's position, right? It's like, people are t talking about giving you a different name. Well, I understand that conversation, but it's not the position that, which I would have at all. I think that, why not stick with this name? Because art, always, as you would say, always had an excess. It never was reduced to that formatting of the institution anyway. So that these things which are not not art are really just ways of, you know, potentializing um, art. Can I just uh, follow up? And I have to apologize. Uh, you have to interrupt me immediately because I was too late. So maybe you already said that. But it would be a question following up on not not art or also not not institution. If you say um, how to escape the classic dialectics that when you have double negation, and I think you, from what I heard in the last part of your lecture, was probably might be a reference through a reading of first total, maybe through Agamben, that there is a possibility to have a double negation which does not cancel it out, itself out and has no synthesis and also is neither stable nor dynamic per se. And it's also, you can say, an asymmetric negation, because what you negate basically is one negation might be determinant, and the other one is indeterminate. So, because in the, in the second one, there must be an indeterminacy, otherwise we would be stuck in the classic dialectics, whether this is Hegel or not, I don't know, but that would be more like a conceptual uh, question for you. For where do you distill this kind of non hegelian double negation that which can, yeah, which is not rapture, but can interrupt or derail a certain position without engaging into a position and an opposition. And when you are in the classic, you know, vulgar Hegelian formula of you never can get out of that dialectics without taking resort to you know, non dialectic as thought as we have also today. Well, that's true, and you're quite right about the. Um, mm -hmm the way uh, Agamben's thinking on potentiality has informed my reference to Aristotle, for example, and allowed me to decode Chomsky's um, opposition around competence and uh, performance. Um, but 
even in a, but in a non-philosophical way. The, what's happened um, to art as it's become somehow massified, um, and where artistic education is now a mass phenomenon, is that art, what were formerly um, artistic competences exclusive to the art world have now become socialized, basically. So to talk about not in art art is also to address the question of the socialization of artistic competence. What happens when um, these, these, uh, these art-informed and art-anchored competences are unleashed um, more broadly and they're taken up by practitioners from other completely different walks of life. I mean, this has been amply documented in, uh, with uh, political activists very successfully using conceptual art strategies, um, you know, not, to, not for visibilizing their campaign, but for actually giving it a kind of trenchant that it wouldn't have otherwise had. And these are the examples that I used to be working with quite a lot. And so I, I'm trying to be mindful of this situation, which I think has also, has, has itself determined the, the, the choice of many art, artistic practitioners to withdraw from that attention economy in order to, to find um, modes of collaboration elsewhere. But, so not reserving that kind of exclusivity which actually has become rather pathetic um, in, the, in the mainstream art world. Um, when you see the kinds of like art informed creativity that goes on um, elsewhere. So um, uh, I mean, even so. What I mean is, even beyond like a uh, like a dialectical picture of this, there is simply uh, a, a description that has to be made about the way art has um, permeated and been uh, disseminated in, throughout society. But uh, I'm also very wary about describing these types of practices, though, as, as art, right? In other words, um, assigning an ontology as art to, to a practice done by someone who had no understanding of it being that and didn't want it to be that. You know, that, that would also, I think, be a very predatory and art-worldly sort of thing to do. I think we have to wrap up. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Stefan. Okay, thanks a lot.